Public education charted a different course 20 years ago. We discuss the history and current state of charter schools in this week's Capitol Report. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. City Academy, located on the east side of St. Paul, was created in 1992, the same year that Minnesota led the nation in its passage of the first charter school legislation. It had a clear purpose to fill the needs of older students who were not succeeding in a traditional educational environment. Milo Cutter, administrator and teacher at City Academy from its inception, explains what precipitated the movement to create the school, the benefits, and the challenges that remain. We were kind of on parallel tracks. The charter law was being developed. The Citizens League is, you know, really the group that made it happen. And we were over here watching and saying, oh, that'd work. That sounds like what we want. And we took it and asked and we were told, oh, I don't think we like that right now. Why don't you try a contract? So we did that, took it back and said, these are still the missing pieces. We really like what's in this new law. Could we try that? And so it, there were things happening simultaneously, but with no cross-fertilization. The students that we wanted to work with were leaving schools because they were too big. Um, they didn't feel they were getting the attention they needed. And when we sat down with them and asked them what they needed, they gave us a design. <laughs> for a small school, and we pursued that. We pursued it through developing a contract school, discovered that there was not the same element of choice for teachers or students in that school, and went the next step and requested a charter. The original vision was uh, envisioned by the students. They wanted a small high school where they would be known and where we could address their academic needs based on who they were and not how old they were. And that's pretty much what we've created with them over the years. Probably the biggest challenge the last couple of years was the you know, shift in funding. And small schools have very little leeway. I suppose most schools have very little leeway, but we certainly felt it the last two years. Where we made adjustments was we did not add, <laughs> and we held back on many things. Some of our extracurricular things, we said another year, another time. So it's much the way you'd have to do at home. It's just, luckily in most homes, they don't have a 40% cut in one year. Some would say there's a disparity in funding, particularly with facilities. Would you concur with that? I think, you know, when I look back over the 20 years, that has probably been the biggest change. Uh, every year, the legislature I, has taken a look at that and done what they can to reduce the disparity. There still is, but it's a far cry from the disparity that was there 20 years ago. Charter schools are considered innovators. Would you also consider the school innovative? And if so, how do you move forward with that expectation? I think that's the expectation for all public educators. I, I, I think that as long as we have students coming through our doors, it's upon us to innovate to meet their needs and support them. Amber Reichgott Young authored the state's charter school legislation 20 years ago and recently wrote a book on the topic. She sat down with us to discuss that work and what she thinks needs to be done to make charter schools even stronger. Thank you for joining us on Capitol Report, Senator. Thank you. Let's talk first a little more broadly about charter schools. They were essentially created to allow a school to operate without the typical oversight and regulations that other schools were uh, managed under and also to allow students to achieve academic excellence in a different setting. So do you think that charter schools are achieving this goal of academic excellence today? 
Yes, I do. And I think Minnesota can be proud. It came right out of the Minnesota Senate and eventually the Minnesota legislature. Originally, Governor Rudy Perpich had a strong role in this in, in providing open enrollment and public school choice, which laid the foundation for chartering. And has it been successful? Yes. What chartering has done is open up the K-12 public education system to new options and ideas and more flexibility. And that not only has provided new opportunities for the 7% of the public school students in Minnesota that attend them, but it also has had a major impact on the public school system itself. And my hope is that we can continue to focus on the new ideas and new innovations and learning strategies from both chartering and district schools. And we'll talk about your book in just a moment, but first you had said that you believe that charter schools have had a tremendous impact on Minnesota traditional schools. How so? What do you think was the greatest impact? Well, the greatest impact was that um, it allowed, here's what chartering is. Chartering is allowing someone other than the public school system to deliver public education. So it opened up the system to allow parents and teachers to come in with new ideas. And these new ideas, some of them were longer school day, longer school year. That's where a lot of that got traction and the public system responded. And I have seen many examples where the district schools have responded to some of the work of charter schools so that they can uh, continue to be responsive to their parents. Now you wrote a book, Zero Chance of Passage, The Pioneering Charter School Story, and it focuses on the beginnings of charter schools. So can you take us back to 1988 and the initial charter school movement and up to 92 when the legislation ultimately passed? I would love to. So first of all, I have always thought of Governor Rudy Perpich as being a visionary. He wanted the brain power state for Minnesota. So he broke all traditions and he proposed with a firestorm a protest against him, the whole notion of public school choice. And so we in Minnesota passed open enrollment and post-secondary options in the mid-1980s before anybody else in the country. Well, Governor Perpich never was aligned, uh, never had a part in charter schools, what I call chartering, but he opened the door to them. And then what happened is that the idea came from two other places. One is that Al Shanker, the president of the American Federation of Teachers, wrote a column in the New York Times talking about something called charter schools to give teachers more autonomy and to help to make the profession more of a profession. And then, in addition to that, here in Minnesota, there was a civic group called the Citizens League that still exists today. And it was a task force of civic leaders who consisted of business leaders, nonprofit educators who came up with the template for chartered schools. And that was what brought it to the legislature. Ted Coldery, still here in Minnesota, is a visionary and was one of the primary intellectual, if you will, authors of chartering. And when you worked this through the legislature, did you really think that there was zero chance of passage, <laughs> as the title indicates? Well, I didn't, but where we got that title is that when we did this book, we interviewed 15 of the uh, people involved in the process uh, 20 years ago. Many were lawmakers, and some were union leaders, and some were national figures. But one of them was Representative Becky Kelso, who is a Democrat from Shakopee, who served in the Minnesota House for many years. And she was the leader and the champion of chartering in the House of Representatives. When I gave her the bill, I learned 20 years later in this interview, uh, when asked, well, what did you think when Ember gave you the bill? She responded, I had zero confidence it would pass. So the title comes from the House author, which just shows you the dynamics and the uh, difficulties of the journey to get it passed. And moving into the present, you're currently the board vice chair of the Charter Schools Development Corporation. So what kind of changes have you seen in the creation and the administration of charter schools? Well, I think uh, that we're always evolving and learning. And what I'd like to see is more and stronger authorizers uh, for chartering as well as uh, stronger board members. But I think the number one problem today for chartered schools is access to facilities. They're not getting equal funding. They're not getting equal funding for the facilities and therefore it is tough, tougher for them to find them and to finance them. So that's one of the things that I think is important. Of course we want to all focus on good quality schools and innovative schools and I think that we're seeing a lot of that in our charter sector today. So are you working with legislators currently to try to 
perhaps even the playing field on this access to facilities and some of the other concerns? I would love to do that next year. I think there's a huge opportunity for that. We're holding back a lot of good charter schools because they don't have access and the same funding for facilities. And that's why I became vice chair of Charter Schools Development Corporation because they're the leading nonprofit provider of financing and development of charter school facilities in the nation. But ultimately, you still think charter schools are very strong? I do, I do. And I think Minnesota can be very, very proud. Um, what I want to be sure to say is that that chartering came from the Minnesota legislature in a bipartisan fashion. It came from the middle of the political system. It came from a bipartisan uh, combination of uh, the Republican minority and Democratic majority. And it also uh, came from outside the political spectrum, like the Citizens League. I don't believe chartering would have passed in the political climate of today. And that's because we don't have a middle anymore. So what I love about this story and all that it was in the journey to get it through, in the end, it passed with 42% of the Democratic majority voting for it and 56% of the Republican minority voting for it with a friendly Democratic Speaker of the House. I hope that we see more big ideas like that pass in the future. Okay, with those words, Ember Rush got Young, thank you so much for this historical perspective on chartering and your ideas for the future. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Commissioner Brenda Casillas of the Department of Education joins me now to talk a little bit about what's next for charter schools. Commissioner, thank you for joining us on the set. Thank you. Glad to be here. Let's begin with the recent anniversary. It was the 20th anniversary of the passage of charter school legislation. Do you think 20 years later that charter schools are reaching the goal of high student achievement? Well, I think that's the question that we have to answer is around achievement. Uh, we have some of the highest performing schools that are charters and some of our lowest performing schools are charters. And so we really wanted to put a strong focus on achievement being their number one goal next to innovation. And so they were kind of uh, created to innovate and to be an incubator for new ideas on how we could better educate students. And um, But we haven't been learning from those high performers and that's really what we've been trying to do and put our emphasis on is how do we learn from those high performers charters and move forward around quality um, and have make sure that any charter school that's out there is a great one. How does protecting the welfare of charter schools fit in with the governor's overall task of maintaining a healthy K-12 education system? Well, charters are part of our, char uh, our K-12 system, and the governor has a strong interest in charters, um, but really high quality charters. We just recently wrote for a charter replication grant with the federal government, got $28.2 million to replicate high performing charters. So um, we are really interested in that and also the role that authorizers play in their oversight of charters and ensuring that they're um, looking at the business operations as well as the academic operations so that they're good fiscal stewards as well as providing a high quality environment for learning. You talked a little bit about the role. I want to know more about the role of the Department of Education in overseeing charter schools, particularly after the 2012 legislature removed a requirement that charter school board members training programs would be approved by MDE. Do you find that MDE should have a, a greater authority in the oversight of charters? Well, you know, we have authorizers and they oversee charters. And so we have greater oversight and we're now authorized, we're exercising our um, oversight of authorizers. And, you know, we get a complaint about a charter and we uh, work with authorizers to resolve it. Um, we think they're the ones who have the largest responsibility. However, having said that, we do uh, still train charters, we work with charter directors, we work with authorizers, and we provide technical support, uh, not only from the application process, but all the way through to ensure quality. And we're looking at those evaluation systems from our authorizers when they do evaluate the programs so that we can ensure that they're high quality. It's something new, it's something that we've just started working on in the new administration, and so um, we think that that's gonna help us to ensure that every single charter is high quality. Okay, Sen I want to ask you a little bit about former state senator Ember Reichgott Young. She authored the charter school legislation 20, 20 years ago, and she contends that even now, traditional schools have had to essentially be more responsive to teaching methods that are used in some of the successful charter schools, and therefore the two kind of complement one another. 
Would you agree with this? Well, that may be her perspective um, and what she's seen um, in my 23 years of educating uh, and working in education. I have not seen a real intentional sharing between charters and traditional public. That's fairly new. Uh, we see some now intentional sharing happening with Minneapolis uh, public schools and um, St. Paul public schools with some of their charters, but there hasn't been an intentional sharing and I think that's where we need to get get to is that if they're really going to be an innovative kind of R&D arm that we look at what those high performers are doing and learn from them. But I don't think that that has historically been uh, how they have worked even though I think it was a good intent. And there is some legislation now to encourage that that sharing. Do you how do you facilitate this the communication between a traditional school district and a charter school? Well, I think the main way we're going to do it right now is through our charter replication um, grant. So we're going to be able to audit and inventory and look at those high-performing charters. We'll also be able to do it as part of our new waiver system and our new improvements. So if we have reward schools and those who are celebration eligible, we'll be able to go in, look at what those practices are, and then share those across hallways, across districts, and uh, get teachers um, really sharing those best practices. So that's more intentional now as part of our waiver, and then we'll replicate those high-performing Forming charters as part of their application for those grant funds. Commissioner, to, for lack of a better phrase, what's good for the goose isn't always good for the gander. So how can you replicate some of what is successful in charter schools without maybe taking away from some of its autonomy? Do you think that what is what's working in one school is going to work in some of these other schools? Well, I think with the replication, it's not necessarily replicating in a traditional, but it's also replicating in the charter environment. So they may, uh, for instance, Hiawatha Academy is probably going to apply for uh, expansion, and they'll expand grades. So they'll be replicating their model, but at higher grades. So we may see some of those models replicate, but they'll still be charters. So we won't be taking away any of their autonomy. Now, in terms of traditional public replicating some of their work with turnaround, they will probably look at some of those autonomies and we do have a new um, law that we passed last year with collaboration and districts collaborating with charters and they can apply to have certain autonomies and so and those are commissioner approved and so we'll look at those individual applications as we um, encourage districts and charters to collaborate. In January of 2012, the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools placed Minnesota second in the nation for charter schools. So we dropped from number one and it cited a potential area of improvement working to provide better access to facilities and capital funds. Do you think it's important to kind of level the financial playing field between charter schools and traditional schools with some of that the levy money in particular. Yeah, we're doing some work with our budget finance group right now to level the playing field for all schools. Um, we think that we have an equity problem here in Minnesota and the disparity has grown among school districts and the amount of per pupil funding that they get. So overall, charters are in that mix uh, when we're looking at our budgeting. And so yes, we need to do funding systems for charters, but we also need it for our traditional publics as well. How would you like to see charter schools evolve? under this administration? I would really like to see our lowest performing charters um, get better or no longer exist or have uh, investment in our high performing charters uh, and replicate those high performing charters. With our focus is totally on achievement and, and on what we can learn from those charters and what innovative models they're, they're using. Many times our charters look much like our traditional public schools and they actually function much like a traditional public. And they're not as innovative as we hoped. So I'd like to see a little bit more innovation happening at those charters and then a more intentionality from us and, and district, district traditional public schools to work collaboratively with our charters um, to be able to try some new things um, that haven't been tried before. Where will charter school policies or policies geared towards charter schools, where do they fall on kind of the uh, priority list as you prepare for the 2013 legislative session? Well, as I think about charters, I think about them in, as public schools. So I don't think charters separately than public schools. So anytime, and they're synonymous to me, um, I, don't, I don't think of them as an anomaly. They are part of our, our school system and have been for 20 years. So they have just as much as importance as any other school uh, to me. And so I think that um, that, that's where they sit in terms of value and priority is if a, if a student is at a public school and they're not getting the kind of education that they need to get, then we need to do something about it, whether it's charter or public. 
Okay, with those words, Commissioner Brenda Casillas, thank you for joining us on the Capitol Report set. Thank you very much, Julie. Last year, there were 220 students enrolled in City Academy, creating a unique atmosphere for the students at this charter school and for the teachers. It feels like a home here, um, with working with the students, more hands-on, more getting to know the students. Instead of worrying about taking attendance for five minutes for 30 students, I'm getting started right away, um, getting more in depth with my teaching, teaching more, covering more material, and just the uh, atmosphere is much different. Um, co-workers are different. If I have a question about a student, I can just run and ask and ask for help, or I have a question about um, something I need help with. Um, everyone's will really willing to help. Is there anything that's maybe a bit more difficult or challenging in a charter school environment compared with a traditional school? Um, I actually didn't have a job at a traditional school, so just comparing with my student working, uh, student teaching, um, I don't, I can't find anything. And people always ask me, why do you work at charter school? And I say, why not? You know, because I, I think there's this um, negative image maybe on charter schools and teaching at charter schools, but I always say. Hey, I love it here and you know the students that sometimes you guys can't work with or have a difficult time with that they can't function in a traditional school. Um, they come here and do very well here. So I can't find anything else that um, I would like more at a traditional school because I think everything's here. since Minnesota passed its charter school legislation. Here to discuss the legislative activity surrounding charter schools, we have the chair of the House K-12 Finance Committee, Representative Pat Garofalo. Thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure, Julie. Let's begin, Representative Garofalo, with how would you grade today's charter school system? In the state of Minnesota, I would give it about an A- minus or a B plus. We do, as many, everyone knows, Minnesota is one of the first state in the nation to have charter schools. And we've done a good job of expanding and promoting those throughout the state of Minnesota. However, the world changes and there needs to be modernization, new accountability metrics put in place. And we've adapted that system through the last 20 years. However, there is more that remains to be done. And you kind of alluded to that. Uh, the legislature has had to step in over the years and pass legislation as different problems would arise particularly recently in the areas of financial accountability and transparency. So do you think more oversight is needed? Well, I think the important thing to remember with charter schools is unlike traditional public schools, when they fail, they fail. They close if uh, parents are not happy with the results, if there's financial impropriety, they close up shop and then new charter schools, the students need to go to new charter schools or new facilities. Whereas in traditional public schools, when they have a financial failure, usually they move into statutory operating debt or there's some level of uh, mechanism of assistance from the state. So I think we're always looking for the best value for the taxpayer. We always want to make sure that there's accountability with those dollars. But right now, I think the, the, the changes we've put in place in the last two years, they seem to be working. Let's give them some time to settle in and make sure they're working. But of course, always have an open mind about anything that can increase financial accountability in any public sector. And spending. let's talk a little bit about those changes that the legislature has put in place and maybe some that you think could still be incorporated, such as um, the, one of the concerns to this day from the, it was a study from the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools. It was released prior to the 2012 session, and that study places Minnesota now as number two in the nation for charter schools instead of first. And one of their key concerns was that Minnesota perhaps didn't provide equitable access to capital funding and facilities. So kind of going back to the, the funding mechanisms, do you see this conversation reviving in 2013? Uh, I don't know if it's reviving, but I think it's evolving. Uh, one of the other criticisms that people have about Minnesota is we're very limited in where we allow sponsorships. We put severe restrictions on out-of-state um, sponsorship organizations, and that kind of limits the quality of authorizers who would have access to, to uh, providing high-quality education to students in Minnesota. But getting back to your 
uh, to your original question, I think we want to make sure that we have the financial controls in place to provide good accountability. The reason why those changes were made is there was some concern that, that charter schools were using lease levy dollars to build their own facilities and uh, have outside organizations financially benefit from those. And those are reasonable concerns. We want to make sure that no one's getting rich off the education system. The purpose is not to, to make a profit or to, private, uh, to provide private business with an increased profit margin. The purpose is to provide a, a appropriate education for students across the state of Minnesota. So we want to make sure that we have that, we have a level playing field with regards to balancing those concerns. And high student achievement, it's obviously the true purpose of charters and, tr and traditional schools as well. So do you think that charters in particular are reaching this goal? Well, some are, some aren't. Uh, there's some very um, amazing success stories, particularly uh, higher ground, the Hiawatha Leadership Academy, Concordia Creative Learning Academy in Minneapolis and St. Paul, where we see that these, these student populations are overwhelmingly low income, overwhelmingly minority, yet some of their achievement scores are higher than wealthy suburbs. So clearly some of these schools it's working at, other charter schools, they need a little bit of improvement, they need to get better results. But one of the purposes of the original charter school legis legislation back in you know, decades ago was to make sure that we had this sort of laboratories taking place, we find out what works and what doesn't work. And it's clear from these decades of research that one of the things that's, that is helpful is giving site managers control over their personnel, allowing them to decide who they want to keep, who they do not want to keep in the classroom, keeps the best and the brightest teachers in the classroom. This is in contrast to traditional public schools where right now in law, we mandate that, uh, that schools are only allowed to use seniority for the retention policies. Um, so charter schools are able to use quality, effectiveness, peer evaluations, but in state law for traditional public schools, uh, seniority is the only thing you can use and that, that keeps the best and the brightest teachers out of the classroom and I think next session I think you're going to see a, a more of a movement to having uh, public schools have that sort of flexibility like charter schools have. And you did talk a little earlier about seeing how charter schools are evolving as chair of the K-12 Finance Committee in the House. What's your vision for how charter schools evolve? Well, first of all, is we want to make sure that charter schools are treated fairly in terms of financing. One of the big changes we made last session is there's something called the Permanent School Fund. It's a multi-hundred million dollar fund the state of Minnesota administers, and we distribute those funds to the public schools of Minnesota. Well, for decades, charter schools did not receive any of that funding. We thought that was wrong, and Governor Dayton and the legislature corrected that problem, so now charter schools are having access to those funds. Uh, additionally, we have sunsetted a program called integration funding, which traditional public schools have had access to, but charter schools have not been allowed to tap into. Even though they have some of the same at-risk populations that traditional schools do, we think it's important that charter schools have access to those funds. But going forward, what we want to do is we want to listen and learn to the charter, learn from the charter school community. Let's find out what's working, let's find out what's not working, and continue to evolve and adapt. One of the great things we're seeing right now is this explosion of technology in the classroom. And we're able to see that technology truly can provide better educational results at a lower price. I'm very excited, I think in the next two to four years, you're gonna see some technology-centric charter schools getting created and built in Minnesota and more of a focus on that where just like in the private sector, they're able to deliver a lower cost, higher quality product, and that product is quality education for kids. So I'm very excited for the future, particularly with technology and charter schools. Okay, with those words, Representative Garofalo, thank you for joining us today, we appreciate it. I appreciate it, thank you. It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the state capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. And that wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Bartke. Thank you for watching Capitol Report.